two weeks have given us the opportunity to bring Britain to all of those curators who haven't yet had the opportunity to visit the UK, who haven't been able to see the very best of what my country can offer. And in the last two weeks we have seen the very best of British fashion, we have seen the very best of British cooking, we have seen the very best of British cars, we've seen the best of British music, uh, we have seen the best of British technology, of innovation. And I think it is fitting that we conclude this fortnight with the lecture uh, that will be delivered by Sir John Major, uh, who will focus on that British-Kuwait relationship, and that it is the first in a series of lectures that we will now institute on an annual basis, and which we are going to call the Dixon Lectures. And it is, I think, even more fitting that we should call them the Dixon Lectures, because it was, of course, Harold Dixon who, in many ways, epitomised the closeness of the relationship between Britain and Kuwait throughout the 20th century, and of course whose house, Dixon House, bears its name to this day. It is my very great pleasure, therefore, to introduce to you Sir John Major. Sir John was the British Prime Minister from 1990 to 1997, and of course he was the British Prime Minister at the time the British troops liberated Kuwait from the forces of Saddam Hussein. It was a difficult period for all of our Kuwaiti friends, but I know and I remember very well my, my, myself at that time that we in the United Kingdom stood shoulder to shoulder with you, and Sir John Major in particular stood head and shoulders above other world leaders as we ensured that the coalition forces under the flag of the United Nations were able to liberate your country from what was a brutal occupation. Sir John, it's very great pleasure to have you here today, uh, and the floor is now yours. Thank you. I'm extremely grateful to the Eurogulf Research Centre and, of course, the University for hosting me on this occasion, and to the British Embassy in Kuwait for inviting me to the tail end of what I understand has been a wonderful two weeks of great British events. This afternoon, I thought I'd like to talk about the relationship between the United Kingdom and Kuwait. There's a great deal to say about our role in the world, about our place and our role in this region, and about our future as key allies. Ours may be an historic relationship, but it's also a living relationship, and it grows and it changes as events unfold. I suppose there's a fundamental question. What does a friendship mean in the modern world? A friendship between two nations as distant geographically and as disparate as the United Kingdom and Kuwait. It seems to me that there are three key elements to such a relationship. The links between our two peoples, the search for stability in a region full of tumult, and the responsibility to help improve economic and social conditions. Many people are prosperous, more are not, and we cannot ignore that. In a moment, I'd like to touch upon the challenges we face, challenges that we could and should meet together. But first, if you'll allow me the indulgence for a few moments, I'd like to talk about what Kuwait means to me personally, about the path of history that has brought uh, us to this great British week in Kuwait and to this inaugural Dixon lecture. I enjoy uh, coming to Kuwait, where I have friends I cherish and memories that I will never lose. When Kuwait was invaded, brutally and unexpectedly invaded in 1990, I met His Highness the late Emir in Saudi Arabia and had no hesitation in pledging British support for the liberation of a long-standing ally. Friendship brings obligations and we British were proud to meet our obligations on that occasion. Later, immediately following the liberation, I flew in to Kuwait to see what had happened. I flew into Kuwait and saw at first hand 
the tragic damage that had been done, done by retreating Iraqi troops. The air I remember very plainly, heavy and thick with smoke from burning oil wells, the acrid taste and smell of that oil pervaded almost everything. The streets were littered with the debris of battle. The Kuwait I saw that day is unrecognizable from the Kuwait that exists today. The glittering towers today that now reach right up to the desert sun, and I suppose most notably the Liberation Tower, are the most tangible monuments to what has been achieved in the last two decades. Now I'm proud that the UK helped to bring this about and of the small role that I personally was able to play. But far more than that, far more than that, I'm full of admiration for the strength of will and the sense of unity of the Kuwaiti people who overcame the trauma of invasion and occupation in order to rebuild their city. But those recollections, recollections, my recollections, they're just a snapshot and only a recent one. The journey that brought the UK and Kuwait together has travelled far more history and shared endeavour than any events witnessed during my own lifetime. Beginning with the trading relationship of two maritime nations in the early 18th century, the story of the United Kingdom and of Kuwait has been one of shared interest, shared respect, and more often than not, a meeting of minds. It isn't surprising, not surprising at all, because we have far more in common as nations than most people realize. It's in both our histories. The story of our two nations is a tale of reform, parliament, monarchy, and individual freedoms. Time and again, we have fought side by side against external aggressors. We British helped defend Kuwait in 1899, 1921, 1961, and of course, 1991. And Kuwait's help in 1940 with the purchase of Spitfire aircraft was absolutely invaluable and helped preserve Britain, win the Battle of Britain, and enable in due course the war to be won. <coughs> and we are both trading nations, trading nations that look to the sea and if, as Napoleon was said to have said, Britain is a nation of shopkeepers, then surely Kuwait is a nation of shop owners. And we are two nations whose social history, whether in the tea houses of London or the diwanis of Kuwait, has resolved around hot tea and often hotter political gossip. Now, of course, in many ways, we are different. Every single country in the world is unique. But we see things in each other that are familiar. And no one encapsulates this better than the Dixon family after whom this lecture series is named. Colonel Harold Dixon was a remarkable man. He was the British political agent <coughs> of Kuwait between 1929 and 1936, but opted to remain in the country he had come to love until his death in 1956. He was survived by his wife, Dame Violent Dixon, who, known as Um Saud, became something of an icon in Kuwait, living here until she was evacuated very, very reluctantly during the invasion at the age of 91. Sadly, she died eight weeks before the liberation, and I dare say she would have been absolutely furious about not being around for that. Dame Violet wrote evocatively about Kuwait, its history, its flora, and of course its people. She was a fixture in the country, often sitting outside the old political agent's residence at Dixon House, 
chatting with her many Kuwaiti friends. I visited that house this morning to see it, to catch the memorabilia that still stay there, live there, almost as though Colonel and Mrs. Dixon were still in residence. The pictures of the growth of Kuwait during the first half of the last century are there squarely placed on the walls of Dixon House, a piece of evocative British Kuwaiti history that if you have not seen it, will certainly bear visiting. I think that Dame Violet would have been very pleased indeed that this annual lecture focuses on the friendship between the United Kingdom and Kuwait. It's a privilege for me to inaugurate it, and I hope that many prestigious British and Kuwaiti figures will speak under its banner for many years to come. The spirits of Colonel Dixon and Dame Violet will surely wish us to do so. But whilst our history is evocative, and our friendship is genuine, it does not highlight what our alliance and friendship means, or can mean, in the modern world of 2014. It provides a compelling backdrop, but no more. It's up to this generation to flesh out the living detail of that relationship. As I said a few moments ago, the potential of a relationship as strong and profound as that between the UK and Kuwait lies in three key areas. First, in the modern networked world of today, it lies in the connections of every type, forged in a myriad of ways between governments, institutions, and above all, individual citizens. Second, it lies in common endeavor, in what we as nations, as people, what we can do to provide anchors for stability and security amidst a region where instability and insecurity can be seen in so many places. Today, Kuwait is an oasis of tranquility in a desert of turbulence. And third, it lies in commerce, in becoming engines for growth, in creating virtuous cycles of trade and investment. And this is a pressing concern in any era, but more so as we recover from the worst global crisis in living memory. Let me elaborate upon each of these points in turn. During the period I was Prime Minister, which in historic terms isn't all that long ago, no one could have predicted the way in which the combination of media, communications and technology would transform political culture and society. Media power was wielded by the few, too few, and often the wrong few. The majority were merely a passive audience. One generation later, social media has given power to the people in new and startling ways. Power to create and lead the news, and sometimes power to lead the political class as well. But it has also given individual citizens the ability to connect in new and very straightforward ways. And this has revolutionized international relations. And we should apply this new reality to the United Kingdom and Kuwait. We take for granted the close connections between our two countries. They're nothing new. But the ease and the intensity with which they are made has strengthened those links. And now, crucially, those links are held not only in the hands of politicians and diplomats, but in the hands of ordinary, everyday people, whether they be Kuwaiti or British. And those links cut right across every sector of society. In business, the British have traded here since before independence. Shell, one of the sponsors of British Week, has been here for 55 years. And Kuwaiti businesses are equally familiar in the United Kingdom. Kuwait's banks are in London. 
and the Kuwaitis even own the Mayor of London's office. In the last two years alone, our trade has doubled to four billion pounds. In government, decision makers continue to visit one another. From His Highness the Emir's highly successful state visit to the United Kingdom in 2012, through to the ministers, ambassadors and officials who meet regularly to learn, share and collaborate together. I was delighted when my old friend, the former British Minister Alistair Burke, and Kuwaiti Under Secretary Al Jarala institutionalised the process through the Kuwait UK Joint Steering Group. And we can see the same cooperation is true in defence, where the British military mission continue to serve in the Kuwaiti Armed Forces and Kuwaiti servicemen continue to take up training in the UK centres of military excellence. But, but, most important of all are the links between individuals. Many young Kuwaitis are studying in universities across the United Kingdom, building friendships and connections that are likely to last the whole of their life. The same may apply to the numerous Kuwaiti tourists. Some estimates suggest as high as a quarter of a million visitors per year who come from Kuwait to the United Kingdom. Similarly, there are 8,000 Britons living and working in Kuwait and enjoying their experience of this hospitable country. Every single one, in their own way, are ambassadors for their own country. All help to enhance and deepen the strength of our relationship. Now, these are just a few examples. I could offer you many more. My point is this, what is best about the UK-Kuwaiti relationship is not traditional diplomacy, not politics, neither of those. It is people, people meeting one another, learning from each other, gaining one another's trust and maintaining their relationship by using the communication links available in the modern age. I believe very strongly that it's the job of British and Kuwaiti governments to facilitate those links. And as we look forward, there is plenty more we can do together, and nowhere more so than in cooperation in the volatile region that is the modern Middle East. In 2011, I, no doubt like many others in this room, looked upon the first wave of popular uprisings that swept through this region with, at first, apprehension, then optimism. It felt like a tide was turning, that people, empowered by the march of technology, were ready to usher in a new era for men and women who had grown tired of broken promises and repressive tactics. Now, that statement necessarily is a broad one and takes no account of the many differences in the countries that experience change. But what is true, almost universally, is that the reality has turned out to be far more contested, far more controversial and far, far more complicated than the optimistic and in some cases complacent predictions of contemporary commentators. History teaches us that change takes time. And yet sometimes the instant gratification of social media and the, the insatiable beast that is rolling news prevents us from seeing this eternal truth. The former Chinese Premier, Zhang Zemin, was once asked for his thoughts on the impact of the French Revolution in 1789 to 1793. His reply was, it's too soon to tell. It was a wise response. In world affairs, we have to play a long game. And during that long game, the UK and Kuwait both have a role, both separately and as allies, in anchoring stability 
and democracy across the Middle East. And I have no doubt that those two virtues are linked. Social and political stability is very important. And social and political stability needs continuous reform, responsiveness, and freedoms, a lesson both countries have learned. So let me put some flesh on the role that I believe we can play in building the future. First, I believe the UK can and must remain steadfast in our commitment to the security of Kuwait and of the Gulf. I was delighted to see the British Foreign Secretary William Hague make this point recently. It's no longer my place to say how this commitment should be kept, nor what form it would take, but it must be kept. And knowing my fellow Britons, I am confident that it will be kept. Second, I believe that the UK and Kuwait must deepen our partnership on international development aid. The Kuwaiti Fund is one of the oldest and most respected development organisations in the world. The UK's Department for International Development is the leading exponent in the Western world for development assistance. And we are seeing in Syria how this partnership might work. UK Minister Alan Duncan was here in Kuwait only two weeks ago for the Syria High Level Donors Group. Now we can take this much further. Between us, we can offer our experience and our help to countries within the region to further stability, good governance, economic reform and poverty reduction. And in so doing, we not only honour our moral obligation to help nations in need, we improve security across the region as well for every nation within the region. Thirdly, I believe the United Kingdom, like other powers the world over, can learn from the Kuwaiti approach to international relations. As a small country in a turbulent neighbourhood, the Kuwaiti ability to manage the competing interests of powerful nations is hugely impressive. And the combination of clever positioning and genuine understanding allows Kuwait, arguably more so than any other Gulf nation, to be an honest broker in a region full of suspicion and mistrust. Now how this unique position can be allied to the UK's historic leadership role in international policy making is a question that those working on relations between our two countries need to consider. But I believe that it can and should be utilised. It is too valuable an asset to be ignored. Now, of course, any politician will tell you that the politics only work when the economics work. And the real substance to any bilateral relations is invariably economic. And this is the final point that I wish to make. I mentioned earlier that bilateral trade between the UK and Kuwait had doubled in the last two years. That's an incredible statistic, doubled in two years. And it demonstrates the potential that exists within the UK-Kuwait relationship. Properly fostered, it can become an engine for growth in both our countries. The key point to making this work is partnership. And the opportunities are there for everyone who wishes to look for them. In Kuwait, the National Development Plan offers an impressive vision for the future. However, as with any vision, the problem is delivering it. Meanwhile, the United Kingdom, after developing the infrastructure for the Olympic Games in 2012, has the recent knowledge and experience to deliver huge projects on budget, on time, and with unrivaled quality. There is surely an opportunity here for governments and companies 
to come together to the mutual advantage of both. The same applies in the fields of healthcare, energy and education. These are areas where the UK excels and where the British government will always be willing to support an historic ally. But the opportunities for cooperation are not only in Kuwait. They're two-way. The United Kingdom is now mercifully out of recession with the highest growth rate among G7 countries and I think that growth rate is rising. The British government has committed to massive investment in infrastructure projects such as high-speed rail and nuclear power. The opportunities for UK Kuwaiti partnerships are obvious. Kuwait-owned, UK-based bank Gatehouse is investing in regeneration in Northern England. The Kuwait Investment Office in London has set up a new office solely to look at infrastructure projects. The future can only bring increased opportunities for joint partnerships that benefit both our countries. But the most original avenue for future partnership is in neither the UK nor in Kuwait. It is much wider. I was intrigued to learn that the Kuwait British Business Council has been discussing UK-Kuwait joint ventures in third countries. And the more I examine that concept, the more impressive it seems to me to be. The UK is the logical gateway for business across the whole of the European Union. Certainly the logical gateway for an historic ally like Kuwait. Kuwait could be the gateway to the wider Gulf cooperation area and potentially Iraq, or further down the line, hopefully, Iran as well. Britain and Kuwait are used to working together. They're familiar with one another. They trust one another. We have complementary skills and shared interests. Here, surely, is an area where our two countries should focus on joint effort. I invite our policymakers to develop this opportunity in both our interests for the future. Before concluding and turning to questions, I'd like to linger on the common thread that has run through all I've had to say. It's about the importance of meeting challenges together. Whether the challenges are political or economic, we as allies are surely stronger together than separately. And I'd like to take that thought just a little bit further. As we look into the future, we shouldn't just think about working together to try and resolve regional crises or development issues, or working together on infrastructure delivery or doing business. Though, of course, all of those are vitally important. Rather, I think the UK and Kuwait should look to each other to share guidance, expertise and advice for all the challenges we face. Just as two friends would turn to each other in times of need. Of course, some of the many challenges our two countries face will be different, but many will be very similar. The UK faces huge and sensitive issues around upgrading our national infrastructure, caring for an aging population, ending social exclusion, and a great deal else besides. What knowledge, advice, and resources can Kuwait lend to solving those problems? And Kuwait, of course, is facing her own set of challenges. Many of these are sensitive. And in a lecture that I wish to be honest, I must touch upon them, not least since true friends should be candid with one another. I know there is controversy in Kuwait about freedom, freedom of expression, anti-corruption, social inclusion, and integration between various groups. These are problems that in one way or another 
the United Kingdom has dealt with in the past, and in my opinion, dealt with well. So let's talk about them. Let's share our experiences, our legislation, our hopes, our fears, and our visions for the future. Both our countries can only benefit from this. And in conclusion, let me say this. The history and the warmth of the UK-Kuwait relationship is clear to anyone and everyone who has ever been engaged with it. It's a friendship born of respect and of common purpose, and it has been nourished by familiarity and affection. And that is why I am so confident that it can be taken further. Maximizing our joint assets would help us both. It would bring greater security, greater prosperity, and greater long-term benefit to all our people, both here in Kuwait and in the United Kingdom. It has been a great pleasure for me to be here this afternoon to deliver this inaugural lecture at the end of a great British week that stretched out to be a great British fortnight. I hope others in the future will develop and enlarge upon the themes I've sought to set out this afternoon. Great Britain and Great Kuwait is a good friendship. Our role in this generation is to enhance that relationship and pass it on to our successors. And that surely is what we all wish to see happen. Thank you very much. This is a doubt. Thank you. 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 Thank you.